My name's Caitlin Cameron. I'm the Senior Policy and Research Coordinator within the Make Smoking History team at Cancer Council WA. We have a program, Make Smoking History, which has been um, running for 24 years now. It's a statewide program in tobacco control, which focuses on the prevention of uh, smoking in adult populations and smoking cessation. We have a campaign, so you would have seen our campaigns um, for many years on TV and radio, for example, our anti-smoking campaigns, and we also use social media. But more recently, we have developed a new campaign called Clear the Air, and I'll be speaking a little bit more about that um, next before I get into the, the rest of the presentation. We also have a priority settings program, and my colleagues in priority settings, they work with um, organisations, so they're in workplaces, uh, the community service organisations that have uh, clients who are highly impacted by tobacco smoking. So they have very high rates of smoking. So they provide resources and support to help those uh, organisations through uh, through change. We also have the, the sub-team that I'm from, which is policy and research, and we focus on commissioning policy-relevant research, um, we work behind the scenes to try and lobby for various law reform changes um, and policies. So that's the work that we do, and that's a picture of our team down there. Clear the air. So just as a bit of background, Cancer Council WA has been working on the e-cigarette issue for more than 10 years. So one of our first position statements on the topic came out in about 2012, 2013, and we've seen a lot of change since then, and we've been heavily involved every step of the way. So Clear the Air uh, was developed in recognition that we needed a new brand and a new campaign. And fortunately, we received funding from Healthway uh, to develop and implement a digital education campaign for young people aged 14 to 24 and using the media that they consume. So social media, things like TikTok, Instagram, um, Snapchat, those sorts of platforms that they uh, use quite heavily. This graph here is from the results of the sorry results of the ASAD survey. So that is a national survey that is conducted, supposed to be um, more frequent, but one of the surveys was missed because of COVID. Um, it's a survey that's conducted with Australian high school students. It's self-report, so they're not. Uh, it's not the parents reporting on their behaviours, it's the students themselves, so it tends to be more reliable. And what you can see, the first time they started asking about e-cigarettes was in 2014. There was an increase in 2017, but what we've seen since then in that five-year period is a quadrupling of vaping prevalence among young people. So now up to, in that older age group, 22.1% uh, have said that they were vaping in the past month and then um, a lower but still very alarming percentage, 12.9% in the, in the younger age group also vaping. So that just shows you the size of the problem. That's national data. So that pattern is seen all over the country and it's been just very alarming at how rapidly vaping has been taken up by this age group. There are a lot of factors that have led to that. Um, COVID seemed to be a catalyst for the importation of very large amounts of illegal vapes, particularly disposable vapes into the country, uh, and problems around enforcement meant that use increased dramatically to the point where it's become quite normalised in that group, unfortunately. So that really sparked the need for a campaign. We also had strong evidence around mostly the short-term health effects of e-cigarettes by this time. So this was a landmark paper produced by the Australian National University um, released in 2022. And it, it was a review of the global evidence on health effects. So by this stage, it was clear that these products have extremely high levels of nicotine. Um, they're highly addic addictive and it's particularly damaging for young people whose brains are still developing. So it can affect things like learning, memory, concentration um, and, set them so, and set them up for future dependence problems. They're harmful to the environment. Um, they contain chemicals which have not been proven safe to inhale. Some of them might be safe to ingest but not safe to inhale directly to the lungs 
but also really worryingly is the evidence around the gateway effect to smoking. So non-smokers who vape, particularly the young people, they're three times more likely to go on to take up uh, regular smoking. Um, so that's supportive of a gateway effect and that's particularly alarming and that's why Cancer Council has been um, has been very strong on this issue since day one, but even stronger as this evidence has, has built over time. Just some examples from the digital campaign. This has been on air since October last year, focusing on social media. I don't imagine that anyone here is in the target audience, so you may not have seen it, but it's mostly sort of short videos which are designed to aim to designed to, to be appealing to young people. And it's really highlighting those hidden harms and those hidden dangers and providing evidence-based information that's clear and accessible. So these are just some posters that we produced using some of the campaign assets, highlighting uh, the chemicals that are found within vapes. Um, the campaign directs people to a website which has information about vapes and health risks and where people can go to seek help because that's one thing that we found young people who are wanting to quit, they've become quite rapidly addicted to e-cigarettes and not knowing how they can get help. So that's one of the aims of the campaign is also to link them in with that support. So this campaign will be running through to at least um, July this year and it was uh, funded by Healthway. So that's an update on our campaign activity. Just an outline of the presentation today. So I'll be covering levels of exposure to tobacco smoke and vape aerosols, drawing on surveys that we conducted um, in 2022 and we've also repeated last year. I'll be looking at some of the evidence on health risks for both, second exposure to secondhand tobacco smoke and also e-cigarette aerosol. Then I'll consider uh, regulatory requirements in workplaces workplace smoke and vape free policies and actions that you can take now. And then we'll open up to discussion at the end. So in 2022, for the first time, we undertook a survey for Safe Work Month and we had 472 WA workers respond to that. And they reported a very high level of exposure, both to tobacco smoke and e-cigarette aerosols at work. So that was very concerning, um, but it was important data to collect so that we had evidence to, support, to, to say that this is still a really significant issue. It's not one that has been solved and particularly with e-cigarettes, um, it's it seems to have been getting worse in recent years. So as Owen said in the introduction, the industries where workers report this kind of exposure are really, really varied. So we've got mining construction that comes a lot up a lot, transport cleaning, education, health, um, hospitality and community services. Workers in these industries all reported some degree of exposure. So e-cigarettes in non-smoking areas. We had people say that staff, customers and clients regularly use e-cigarettes in non-smoking areas um, and workers find themselves exposed as a, as a consequence. So these are just some quotes that people um, gave when they responded to the questions. And some of this goes to changes in social norms and cultural um, expectations. And Owen gave a few examples in his introduction about how you know, this person, this mining worker is saying some vapors think that they do not need to follow the same rules as smokers. So there's been this shift in social norms. These are social norms that have changed over time um, with regards to smoking over many decades. And a lot of that is due to various law reforms and lobbying um, over a very long period of time that has taken to really shift those social norms. But they don't seem to apply to the same extent in relation to e-cigarettes. And again, similar example um, to what Owen mentioned, customers actually vaping inside a restaurant, um, thinking that, you know, perhaps the hospitality workers won't really mind or it's not as bad. This is something that you would not see. You would not see a person smoking inside a restaurant generally um, today. That would be very, very rare, um, but it is something that we're seeing. We've also at Cancer Council received complaints from people who have attended um, indoor concerts and, uh, you know, live music venues and things like that. And they've reported just really extensive vaping throughout. Um, so that is a challenge. This person said they're exposed everywhere. Vapors um, abuse the smoking rules more than the tobacco smokers. So similar kind of theme coming through. 
Outdoor areas was an area of concern, walkways, footpaths, thoroughfares. Um, some of these are communal areas such as lunchrooms and outdoor eating areas. So these are some of the quotes, outside buildings when walking between offices. For example, um, construction sites uh, can be an area where people are exposed uh, during the build. And a few more examples from construction work sites. People also reported smoke or aerosol drifting. So people smoking or vaping near doorways, windows and entrances to buildings and then that drifting through. So we know particularly with tobacco smoke is very difficult to contain. So it tends to, it tends to drift um, through. And they reported concerns that the aerosols um, drift further than tobacco smoke in some cases. So mining workers, community service workers, talking about being exposed inside the building. Um, people smoking and vaping too close to an entrance door and fumes wafting in, having to walk through them. Or this person complaining about um, inside a workshop building, smoke blowing inside from workers who are outside. So it does travel and can affect people who are working inside as well. Mining camps came up as an area of concern in the survey. So there are a lot of responses from people saying that they're smoking and vaping near accommodation and crib rooms. And in some cases, workers are not, um, not just smoking or vaping in designated areas, but in other parts of the camp, um, particularly around accommodation. This person reported tobacco smoke and vape smoke carried via underground ventilation at underground crib rooms, people smoke in closed cab vehicles. So that just shows how widespread it, it can be. And more examples from, from the camp. So that seems to be that seems to be an area in which people can be um, quite heavily exposed. So we've repeated the survey uh, last year and we'll have results um, around the middle of this year. But they, the results at the moment, they're showing quite similar issues as in the previous year. So it's, it's consistent and we see the same kinds of themes uh, coming up. So we'll continue to do these surveys so that we can monitor. And uh, particularly after, I'll talk more about the new regulation that has, it will be coming in around vaping and we'll follow up the survey and, and after that um, regulation has been has commenced, we'll see if there's been any changes to the level of exposure. We hope so. Okay. So just in, in terms of the evidence around health hazards, so the harms of secondhand exposure to tobacco smoke are really well known. So they've been known for decades. For adults who are non-smokers, if they're exposed to secondhand smoke, it can be a cause of lung cancer, stroke, nasal irritation and heart disease. For children, it can cause asthma, wheeze illnesses, respiratory illnesses and reduced lung function. And for babies who are in a house where there are adult smoking, um, or if it's a pregnant woman, uh, it can mean they're born with a lower birth weight, um, or if they're an infant, uh, if they have a higher risk of SIDS. So that's why um, this has to be taken so seriously, because there are these, these really serious health impacts. For exposure to secondhand vape aerosols, because vaping is much newer, there isn't that same body of evidence yet around secondhand exposure and the health impacts. We do know that they contain unsafe chemicals um, and that those chemicals are released into an aerosol. So it's not a water vapour like a lot of people think. It is a chemical aerosol that is being released into the air. There is evidence that uh, they contribute to airborne particulate matter in indoor environments, but less is known about how they affect air quality in outdoor environments, for example. So what you can see is that the evidence on the health risks is new and is incomplete. There have been no long-term studies and, you know, sort of cohort studies because people just haven't been vaping for long enough, particularly um, not long enough to see those perhaps diseases that have a long latency period. Um, there's also been no studies on vulnerable populations who might be at a higher risk of health impacts. So in this situation, we would argue that the precautionary principle applies. So there's a need to minimise that those possible risks while that 
evidence base is still developing. In terms of safety hazards, so it's not just those short and long-term health risks, but there are also safety hazards associated with tobacco smoking and vaping in workplaces. So for tobacco smoking, there's the obvious risk of fire from discarded butts, um, risk of explosions, interactions with toxic agents. So that is where, for example, um, a chemical uh, is, is absorbed into cigarette and so then the person um, has a much higher exposure when they, they draw on that cigarette. There's also the loss of attention that comes with, with smoking and that might put the person at higher risk of other kinds of accidents. For vaping, there's the additional risk of accidental nicotine poisoning and this can be through skin contact, inhalation or ingestion. Nicotine is a highly toxic poison. So this can happen um, more easily and it can be extremely serious and can lead to you know, nicotine poisoning and that could include um, somebody having a seizure, it could include somebody becoming unconscious um, or it could even be fatal depending on the dose and their circumstances. There's also the risk of battery fires and explosions that come with e-cigarettes. A lot of these have lithium batteries, um, particularly in the, the illegal vapes that come from overseas. There has really been no quality control around those batteries, so there is a, a, a real risk of fire associated with those um, and an ongoing problem around their safe disposal. There's also, as with smoking, the risk around loss of attention. And this image, a bit gruesome, but it is an image from an accident that was reported to Demirs in January 2021. And this burn was caused by um, an explosion where a vape battery ignited in a worker's pocket. Uh, and it wasn't just him at risk because he was also travelling with two other workers at the time. So that shows the, the kinds of um, injuries that, that can occur. The regulatory requirements around smoking, so these are, are, are well known because they've been around for a long time. Um, there's a general duty uh, in the regulations, secondhand smokes a known health hazard, so the PCBU must reduce these risks so far as reasonably pract practicable. There's also specified in the regulations and also in the mind regulations that smoking in enclosed workplaces is prohibited and there are definitions around how enclosed is defined. Just a note there about vehicles. So smoking is only permitted in a person's own vehicle or residence if no other co-workers are present. Are present. In terms of public places, our, our state tobacco products control regulations prohibit smoking in enclosed public places and within five metres of a public entrance to an enclosed public place and also within 10 metres of an air intake for air conditioning. So that's to prevent some of that smoke uh, drift that I talked about earlier. So you'll notice with the second point that the that prohibition is limited to enclosed workplaces. So that's there's a gap there that I'll talk about a bit later around outdoor workplaces. In terms of um, the state regulations, there's that prohibition in enclosed public places and those can also be enclosed workplaces. And then there are also um, other public places, outdoor public places that have smoking restrictions as well in the legislation. So in, if for vaping, it's it's a lot less clear. So we still have those general duties um, that apply, but there are currently no provisions specifically about vaping in workplaces, but this will change soon. So it has been announced publicly that um, regulations will be drafted this year to 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 ban vaping in workplaces. Presumably it will mirror those regulations for smoking. So it will be a ban on vaping in indoor workplaces, but we don't know exactly how that will be worded yet. So we'll have to wait until that comes um, into force to, to see what effect that will have. But um, that's a really encouraging development um, to see that. So it provides, a, it provides a lot of clarity because workplaces have um, not really known you know, how do we deal with vaping as an issue. 
So vaping in enclosed public places is not prohibited by our state um, tobacco products control act and i've just made a note that this is this is likely to change it's more of a sort of an anomaly um, around the legislation we know that there is a lot of community support for this to change so about 80 percent of people when we have surveyed have said that they believe that vaping should not be allowed in public smoke-free areas so it's likely that uh, that this will change um, as part of a package to to um, to implement other vaping-related reforms in WA, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Public transport workers, actually, in, in terms of the regulations, have, have better protection than other workers because the public transport regulations prohibit vaping on public transport and on public transport facilities where, where there is a no-smoking vaping sign. And you'll also be aware that some local governments are expanding smoke-free local laws to cover vaping. So those apply to public smoke-free areas, so they also become vape-free. And again, we know, yeah, there's a lot of public support for that to happen. So that's something we're working with local governments to achieve. So in terms of policy and regulation, a lot has been happening over the past two years. In May last year, there were some big announcements around uh, vaping at a Commonwealth level. So what has happened is from the 1st of January this year, there's a ban on the import of all single-use disposable vapes. So these are the vapes that are very popular with children, and that's why it was really important to, to ban their import. So what it means is that it will make it much easier for Border Force to actually seize those products as they come in um, and destroy them. So that should really reduce the supply and the easy access that young people have had to vapes, um, and it should be a lot harder for them to obtain. So that's a really positive development. Then from the 1st of March, that ban on import, so this is through customs regulations, that will ex extend to the import of non-prescription vapes. So what that means, they're not therapeutic. They're vapes that are not being used for smoking cessation. They're not being used to treat nicotine dependence. They're vapes that are being used without a prescription from uh, a medical prescription and they're not being used under medical supervision. So there'll be a ban on the import of those as well. Um, and that's really to, to address that illegal supply that I talked about. Um, but as you can see, it's not, it's not a complete ban. There is still that medical pathway for people who have a medical need to access e-cigarettes. So that will still be open to them. In uh, early this year, it's been flagged that uh, the government plans to introduce a bill to ban the domestic supply of non-therapeutic vapes. So that means that this it, it has more effect uh, in other states and territories around Australia. It has been legal to sell e-cigarette, non-nicotine e-cigarettes to adults in retail shops. Under this model, vape nicotine vapes will only be sold through pharmacies. So there'll be no other retail sale of them. So this is a this is a bill to try and deal with that supply issue at a national level. So that will be a very significant change and that, that bill will be coming, um, I'm not sure, but sometime this year. And then in late 2024, other changes that have already been flagged by the TGA are things like increasing the minimum quality standards for vapes. So there'll still be unapproved medicines. They haven't been approved for things like smoking cessation, but there will be some minimum quality standards to meet. Um, it will restrict flavours and colours and other ingredients. This is to reduce demand and make them less appealing. They will also be required to be supplied by pharmacies in pharmaceutical or medical-like packaging, so not, you know, sort of attractive, colourful packaging with cartoon pictures and things. And then um, nicotine concentrations and volumes will be reduced um, to reduce the risk of accidental poisoning, for example. So this is a package of reforms that are really aimed at addressing supply and addressing illegal supply, um, illegal supply and importation that has really fueled the you know epidemic use of um, e-cigarettes by young people. So these I'll just also add that these reforms are things that 
uh, Cancer Council as a federation, so all of the cancer councils around Australia, had been advocating for for a very long time, so for many years, um, to address this the supply issue. And then, of course, we complement that with measures that reduce demand for the product as well, like our campaign that I mentioned at the start. So there are a lot of really promising changes coming in terms of uh, vaping, um, those Commonwealth regula regulatory changes, but then also the in WA that ban on um, vaping in the workplace. But there are still some gaps in protection of workers. So workers don't have equal protection from tobacco smoke and um, e-cigarette aerosols. Vaping remains a problem and there's, even when that ban comes into place, we expect that there will be some ongoing problems around uh, compliance and enforcement, particularly in areas like mining, construction and hospitality. They're probably going to um, face some challenges there. There's a lack of protection for outdoor walk workers because the regulations only refer to those enclosed spaces. Home care workers are at risk, as Owen mentioned. Um, this is becoming a bigger issue, one that Cancer Council would like to investigate further, particularly with um, the arrival of NDIS and home care packages and things. There are more workers who are going into people's homes, um, community nursing, aged care, disability support. Um, some of that around disability support uh, are un, is unregulated, so these workers are quite vulnerable to exposure and they, also, they often don't feel like they can ask clients uh, not to smoke around them or not to vape. So that's a problem that we'd like to, to research. Um, hospitality workers in liquor licensed venues in WA are also at high risk of exposure um, if the venue has an outdoor smoking area. So that's an exemption that's in our state legislation um, that we'd like to see removed because it does put these workers at risk in that they're working in a smoking area. There've been some really positive announcements recently about the rollout of uh, smoke-free prisons to uh, some of the women's estates. So we really welcome that, but um, that does need to be rolled out through to all prisons as prison workers remain at high risk and WA is one of well is the last jurisdiction in Australia to go smoke free with prisons that's really important and then finally community and social service workers who are working in accommodation settings so that could be hostels refuges AOD rehabilitation and things like that they're very challenging settings where we do find um, a high level of exposure to uh, tobacco smoke and also vape aerosols. So that's something that our priority settings uh, team is looking at closely and doing um, really great work, but it is, it is an area where um, we do see quite high levels of exposure. <laughs> so action that can be taken now. So especially with the, uh, with the ban on vaping in workplaces coming, it's a really good opportunity to review whatever uh, smoke-free policy your workplace might already have in place. And what we found is that there's been an uptick in workplaces that have contacted us uh, looking for support. They may have not really looked at their smoke-free policy for a long time, but they've started to have issues around vaping and that has really prompted them to review that. So that's something we'd encourage. And the policy, it just needs to explain clearly what the purpose is, the time frame for implementation. You need a really clear statement on where smoking and vaping is not permitted. We would say generally to avoid designated outdoor areas um, because there are problems associated with them. They can be quite difficult to locate and they can attract litter and noise and things like that um, unless they're essential or they're in a transitional period only. So as part of a a shift towards smoke and vape free workplace. They may be a necessary step on the way. Um, and the policy should also look at what are the consequences for non-compliance and really importantly, what is the support available for smokers? That's something that sometimes is left off the policies, but it really needs to be clear that the workplace is able to support smokers and we can help with that um, with our resources and campaign materials and referrals um, to Quitline and all sorts of things. So make sure that that's included in there. Top actions to address smoking and vaping. 
do an audit of staff exposure if you're not sure. You might be surprised by the results. With some of the results that we got in our Safe Work Month survey, we weren't really expecting, so we were a bit surprised at the high levels that we found. Um, form a committee to review the policy. And uh, Julia is going to send round two templates that we've developed for workplaces to make it really easy. So we have a smoke and vape free workplace policy. The first one is 100% smoke and vape free. And then the second one just has a limited exception uh, around a, a designated smoking area if that is, is deemed necessary and suitable for your workplace. So we've tried to make it really easy to have a, a policy that complies with all the current regulation and is set out clearly. Another thing that you can do is improve signage. Um, you know, th this is often this kind of thing is quite self-enforcing. If people see the signs, they know what the rules are, especially with smoking, they are, are generally, you know, happy to comply um, with those. Uh, and with vaping, they may be unaware of what, what the workplace's rules are. So there needs to be signage around that. Um, we'd also encourage you to check, it out, check out our campaigns and resources at makesmokinghistory.org.au. That's all for the presentation.